My name is Joel Dice. I work at Fermion. I'm a software engineer there, uh, primarily working on improving the guest language support for various languages uh, for WebAssembly and WASI. And uh, today, a part of that, I'd like to discuss um, uh, kind of the ongoing work we're doing to make WASI better, uh, particularly with respect to concurrency, uh, which is such an important part, especially of cloud computing, where you're talking uh, to HTTP servers, you're talking to key value stores, you're talking to databases, uh, et cetera. Uh, and uh, you, know, you want to be able to multiplex that. You want to do more than one thing at a time. Uh, and uh, one of the big selling points of the component model is the ability to compose. It's right there in the name, components. You want to compose them. Uh, and uh, being able to combine those two features, being able to concurrently do multiple operations at the same time and compose uh, multiple units, each of which are doing that, uh, is a pretty obvious thing to want. Uh, and so uh, we don't have a great story for that today, but we're, uh, we're going to... Uh, have that uh, coming down the pike here. So we'll jump into it. The agenda here, uh, I'll start by just kind of giving a quick overview of the limitations of WASI P2, which we actually knew about before we even shipped it. Uh, they were no surprise, uh, but we had to ship something. Uh, and, you know, as an old colleague of mine said, you don't sit on value. You know, if you've got something valuable, even if it's not perfect, get it out there and then iterate. Uh, so uh, that's what we did. Uh, and now it's time to, to iterate, and that's what uh, P2 or P3 is all about. Uh, the goals uh, for that is the, will be the next segment. And then we will uh, look at sort of a quick design summary. If you caught Luke's keynote yesterday, uh, he went into quite a bit of detail on what the design looks like, and he's got some other presentations from Wasm.io uh, and earlier that you can look up on YouTube uh, to kind of get the full picture. Uh, and then also give some links to the component model repo where we're doing all that design work in the open. Uh, and then we'll look at some code examples. This is the part that's really interesting to me. Uh, what does this look like in Python? Or what does it look like in Go or Rust or C Sharp? Uh, that's, that's super important. Uh, that's, that's all part of the polyglot story that makes uh, WebAssembly so, so exciting to a lot of people. Um, and then finally, we'll look at the implementation status and. Uh, look at ways you can help if you're interested in, uh, in jumping in. Okay, so the limitations of WASP2, again, no surprises here, uh, but we, we did have to uh, postpone some of the goals we had uh, for the, the final uh, kind of 1.0 edition of WASI. Uh, to get something out the door. Uh, the big thing is WASI IO. I was just talking with, uh, with Mindy, one of the, the WASM, WASI or uh, web GPU guy, uh, and uh, he, uh, he, he was uh, talking about how he wanted to virtualize uh, WASI IO poll and how difficult that was, and it is truly, it's a difficult thing. Uh, it's also uh, kind of, it's limited in the sense that you want to do intercomponent communication, not just with bytes, uh, but also potentially higher level data structures like records and so on. And then uh, you, uh, you also, uh, it's been a challenge to implement efficiently and idiomatically things like back pressure, which you would expect for any sort of network uh, stream, uh, turned out to be a little bit awkward in WASI P2. Uh, and uh, so uh, mapping that to idiomatic uh, standard library functions in most languages turned out to be difficult. Uh, Why is poll? This kind of gets to the heart of what makes composing concurrent components so difficult. Basically, only one component can really call poll at a time, which means you're blocking any other components that might want to do work. Uh, and there's ways around it, but they're really awkward, and they cause essentially information leakage, where you'd have to have pass a, a pullable from one component to the other, so that that other component can kind of pull on the first component's behalf. Uh, and it, it doesn't really match the, the sandboxing model that we're really going after here. Uh, and then WASI HTTP, uh, Luke went into this in his presentation, but a, um, uh, the, the API is big. There's a lot of redundancy, basically separate APIs for incoming and outgoing um, uh, resources. Uh, and then streaming middleware, uh, which is something really important, like if you're trying to do some sort of transformation on the body of a response, uh, turns out to be prohibitively difficult uh, to do via composition. Uh, and there's various workarounds people have come up with uh, uh, for it, but we really want to uh, tackle the problems uh, head on. 
So uh, the goals kind of fall out of those limitations. Uh, the, the first one, uh, pretty non-negotiable. Uh, we've been you know, touting WASI P2 as something that's ready to use, and it really is. Uh, and we want to make sure that continues to be the case even after WASI P3 comes out. So uh, to that end, we're making sure that it, WASI P3 is fully compatible. Uh, you know, the first step being that host would support both of them at the same time. Uh, and then later on, we can virtualize uh, WASI P2 in terms of WASI P3 uh, uh, so that the host doesn't have to support the, the older APIs natively. Um, uh, the, the, the headline feature is composable concurrency, uh, essentially being able to uh, take each of these languages' event loops. You know, C-sharp has its own event loop for managing tasks uh, in an async await manner. Uh, Go has its uh, basically green threading or, or sort of multi-threading Go routines uh, being managed uh, uh, in a lightweight runtime. Uh, JavaScript, they all have these event loops. Essentially, what we want to be able to do is provide the primitives necessary for these guest event loops to defer to what you might think of as a higher level event loop in the host, which can kind of see everything and manage everything and make sure that, you know, uh, when in each individual languages uh, or each individual components event loop runs out of things to do, it can basically defer back to the host. The host will decide, okay, Maybe there's nothing any of the components can do if we're waiting on network traffic or whatever. Or it can say, oh yeah, I, okay, thanks for deferring to me. I'm going to actually give uh, you know, some CPU cycles to this other component that can make progress. Uh, so it's essentially creating, maybe you could imagine a hierarchy of event loops here um, in the limit. Uh, and then uh, because I mentioned Go and C-sharp, uh, those are great examples of uh, kind of two ends of the uh, cooperative multitasking spectrum. Uh, at one end, you have C-sharp uh, and, and, and JavaScript and Rust and, and a lot of others that are using stackless coroutines. Uh, and what that means is you don't need to have a dedicated call stack for each task. Uh, the, the, state, uh, the state machines that represent these async tasks can be persisted to the heap. Uh, and so you can essentially use the same WASM call stack for all of them. Uh, whereas uh, Go routines uh, and maybe uh, Java fibers uh, uh, involve dedicating a stack to each of those, and uh, that has some real nice ergonomic benefits. Um, uh, you know, and it's it's a trade-off. Uh, each one has its merits, uh, and we want to support both for WASI P3, and we'll we'll talk more about that. Uh, and then idiomatic language bindings. <clears throat> you know, we uh, one of the challenges with WASI P2 is, I, as I said, there's a bit of an impedance mismatch between kind of what the low-level bindings that the WIT, uh, uh, WIT bind gen would generate versus kind of what standard libraries want to present uh, in, in their inter interfaces. And we want to kind of create a convergence between those, uh, make it feel like a natural part of uh, a developer's experience. Uh, and then finally, we'll deprecate WASI IO. Uh, essentially, we're moving what WASI IO does today down into the component model itself, uh, which uh, kind of feeds into uh, the other goals. Okay, and so just a, a quick aside here. Um, uh, so some of you who have been in this community for a while can probably already uh, uh, know the answer to this, but uh, you know, might be wondering if you're new to this, why is shared everything, or shared nothing rather, uh, composition so important? Uh, the, the one that people have talked about a lot uh, in the couple, couple, past couple of days uh, is polyglot composition. Uh, uh, Christoph's uh, presentation that preceded mine uh, went into kind of the, you know, how difficult it is traditionally to use kind of the lingua franca in the programming world, which is the CABI, uh, in a safe way the, uh, such that you can kind of provide idiomatic uh, interfaces on both sides of that uh, of that interface, and it turns out that that wit uh, kind of hits a pretty good sweet spot there uh, for uh, interop. <clears throat> Uh, the other big thing that I don't think gets talked about enough is 
uh, this uh, sandboxing model, the fine-grained sandboxing model. Of course, WebAssembly has always been about sandboxing from the beginning. Uh, the component model kind of takes that a, quite a bit further uh, in that you can essentially divide up your application uh, into uh, different trust domains, if you will. Uh, and so this kind of goes back to what the embedded folks were talking about of uh, you know, mixed criticality. Uh, and this could have to do with you know, uh, different kinds of resources, uh, CPU resources that can deal with regulated data, HIPAA data, uh, credit card data, that sort of thing. Essentially being able to pass around opaque handles to things uh, across component boundaries and then be able to assert statically that components which should not have read access to critical data do not, uh, and those that, that do have access, uh, you know, that, that, that those are identified. Uh, and this all feeds into supply chain security. You know, we, people talk about log, you know, log4j and the fiasco there. Uh, you know, if, you're, if your logger shouldn't have network access, don't give it network access. You know, it's, uh, it's um, you know, limit, limit the damage that a third party dependency can do, uh, which, you know, lowers your stress level if there is a vulnerability. Uh, and then finally, although this isn't part of WASI Preview 3, uh, the intention is that in the future we'll have runtime instantiation and the ability to restart, have a parent component restart its uh, subcomponents uh, on the fly in an Erlang style uh, supervision tree, uh, which is pretty exciting. Uh, again, all in the service of limiting the blast zone, uh, limiting the damage a misbehaving uh, subcomponent can do. Um, and okay, so quick design summary again, I would uh, defer to Luke's uh, wonderful presentations on the details here, uh, and you can always uh, read up on the component panel repo, uh, but just quick high level thing, well, we're introducing a new uh, async ABI for both uh, imports and exports uh, that can be used. Uh, for functions. Uh, the stackless one uh, involves providing a call callback, which uh, uh, the allows the host to essentially deliver events uh, asynchronously to that component uh, as they happen. Uh, the stackful one essentially says, okay, do a blocking call and I will suspend, uh, here speaking as the host, uh, guess you can go ahead and do a blocking call and uh, if, if I need to do, if that turns out to be a blocking operation, it needs to block on the network or something, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and suspend the stack uh, that was involved in that call, uh, possibly uh, use another stack, uh, this is where stack switching, the core stack switching proposal comes in to call back into you again uh, because by using this async ABI, you've essentially declared that you are a reentrant and being capable of uh, handling concurrent, multiple stacks concurrently uh, executing in that same instance. Uh, and then uh, another big part, and this one's a little bit mind bending, but uh, the, it turns out to be kind of a, the linchpin of the design and super important is this uh, task return, task dot return built in. And what that allows a uh, export to do is it, when, when the host calls the export, uh, it can call task.return to return the value and then continue executing additional code, which is, uh, I say it's mind bending because it's not something we're used to, you know, at the source code level when we're writing uh, C code or uh, C sharp code or uh, Java code. Uh, because you, the idea is that you return a value, you're done. You know, you've, you've returned, uh, you've given execution back to the callee. Uh, and so you might wonder what this looks like in, uh, in Python or, or C, et cetera, and we'll, we'll see that in a moment. But it's, it's very powerful, especially when you're returning one of the instances of the next two types here, which are stream and future. Uh, because if you're returning either a stream or you're returning an object that has a collection of streams or whatnot, uh, being able to execute after you've returned that value allows you to then feed values to that stream. Uh, and that turns out to be the idiomatic way uh, to do things like WASI, uh, uh, WASI HTTP, uh, return a re response, the host can start sending that response off of the, the network, uh, and then you can start feeding content in the body uh, via that stream. And then future, the same idea, it's like a degenerate stream. Uh, you just use it once, it's like a one-shot stream. Uh, but just think, think in terms of channels, like if you're from, coming from the Go world or the Rust world, uh, these are basically channels uh, that you can do intercomponent or uh, component to host uh, or, or vice versa uh, communication. 
Uh, and so as a case story, uh, study, this is uh, a case that Fermion cares a lot about and uh, you know, Nginx and others. Uh, let's, oh, the contrast is pretty crappy there. Sorry about that. Um, the, uh, but is WASI HTTP. Uh, and to me, it's, like, uh, it, it's, it's a really good example because it actually uses a lot of these new features that we're adding. Uh, and because we pushed a lot of this WASI IO complexity down into the component model and also refined the interfaces, uh, we've been able to vastly simplify, uh, as I think uh, uh, Luke said yesterday, we've gone from like 13 resource types down to four resource types. Uh, big improvement, it's very symmetric. The, you use the same types and the same functions to do outgoing requests as you do to accept incoming requests. Uh, this is a, a summary, but it's actually not that much more complicated than what I have in this summary. Like there's a couple extra functions, getters and setters, kind of things you would expect. Uh, but you know, this kind of gets to the, the heart of it. Uh, you, we have a body object, which sort of encapsulates the content, the, the, the body of the, the request or response, and then trailers, if, you, if you've seen that in uh, HTTP2. Uh, if you do gRPC, that's kind of a big deal. Uh, and then uh, each of the request and the response can take a set of headers and a body. And you know, there's a couple other things, there's status codes and stuff like that, but, uh, but it's pretty simple. It's basically what you would expect uh, uh, an HTTP API to look like. Uh, and so those were the types, and then these are, uh, the, this is basically the interface for WASI HTTP, it's handler. And again, this kit serves the dual purpose for handling incoming requests if you export it, uh, and it handles uh, uh, outgoing requests if you're importing it. Um, and then a proxy, pretty simple. You import handler and you export handler. You can do both, both directions. Okay, so what does this look like? Uh, so here's a Python example. Uh, we're just writing some streaming middleware here, so we don't want to buffer the whole response, but we want to essentially stream, the mid uh, stream a response of an upstream request handler, uh, uh, stream that body, and we're going to compress it. We're going to use the deflate compression algorithm, uh, and we're going to compress it. And so uh, what that looks like in WASI P3 is, well, the, the signature here is just what we saw in the last slide. Uh, we take a request, we return a response. Uh, and so this gets to, okay, what about task return? Like if we return a response, how do we in Python then do more work after we return that response? And that's what this spawn, uh, this, this guy right here, uh, the spawn, oh, you, can you see my cursor? Maybe not. Uh, anyway, the second to last line there, uh, that spawn function, basically we're gonna spawn an async task which will stream, uh, basically read the incoming body from the upstream request handler that we deferred to and then compress it on the fly, you know, chunk by chunk. Uh, and, uh, and so that spawn, that thing that we spawned is essentially, you can think of it as a background task that will continue running after uh, we've returned uh, on the last line there. And otherwise, hopefully pretty straightforward, you know, we, we add an extra header. I'm omitting some details here. We should probably, like if the there's a content length header, we might want to remove that and change it to chunked encoding, but you know, there's only so many lines on this, uh, on this slide uh, to make it readable. Um, and so this is just the compressed thing. It's basically, um, you know, the WhipBindGen would generate essentially these byte stream reader and byte stream writer um, uh, types uh, uh, in response to the interface that basically says stream of UA, stream of UA. We'll specialize on that, giving that byte streams are, are such an important thing. Uh, we, we'll, we'll make sure the binding generator generates idiomatic code for that. And then we just go through in a loop, uh, you know, read the bytes, compress them, write the, any, any output, and then at the end you always have to flush the compressor, make sure that you get any uh, uh, final bytes there uh, written out. Uh, and then and then we're done, uh, and that's that's the code. That's the code for doing uh, compressing middleware. Uh, so that's what. And you'll notice we've got the async and await stuff. Uh, uh, if I go back here real quick, uh, you know we got we're, we're using async, we're using await at multiple stages. Um, uh, so we're essentially using this stackless uh, uh, cooperative multitasking that's built in to Python. I don't know when it was introduced, but uh, it's, been, it's, it's been out there for a while. And you can use all the, uh, 
uh, the infrastructure in the standard library, the async IO library for composing tasks, running them in parallel, doing fork join types of operations. Uh, and you know, if you're familiar with that, that, uh, that paradigm in, in Python, you'll feel right at home. Uh, so let's look at what this looks like in Go. Uh, as I said earlier, Go, in contrast, does not use stackless coroutines. It uses stackful coroutines or, or Go routines. Uh, and it, you, you see on the uh, second to last line there, uh, you know, a, a very common paradigm is to uh, do uh, multitasking via uh, the Go keyword. Uh, and that allows us to do essentially what we're doing in Python with that spawn call uh, to launch a Go routine that is going to take care of streaming that body and doing the compression uh, on the fly. Uh, and so, otherwise, you know, the pattern looks very similar. You know, Go has a different way to handle errors, uh, but, uh, but overall the, the code hopefully feels very idiomatic. Um, uh, I guess, and you know, in, in particular, you know, the, this idea we create a new byte stream and then pass the uh, transmit end to the Go routine that we're spawning there. Uh, and that's very, you know, very idiomatic. You know, the idea with with Go is, you know, uh, don't don't communicate via memory. You know, uh, share or don't don't share memory. Don't communicate by sharing memory, but share memory by communicating. Uh, so that's what we're doing here. And the big difference here, the thing that I really want to emphasize here, is that you know, we're, whereas Go routines and Go channels tend to only make sense within the Go runtime, we're now communicating component to component using the same paradigm and the sort of, sort of same idiom. Uh, and the other end might not be a Go routine. It might be a, uh, you know, a Python program or a Rust program, et cetera. So that's pretty fun. Uh, and so this is the compress function, uh, you know, just using the standard uh, IO write and IO read uh, interfaces in the Go standard library uh, and the, the built-in uh, flate, uh, flate um, uh, library uh, to do the compression. Um, the error handling here isn't great. We probably shouldn't crash if there's an I.O. error, but I, again, I didn't want to spend a huge amount of time on this example and build it out like I would uh, you know, a real-world system. Okay, so implementation status. We're making good progress on this. Um, Luke mentioned this yesterday. Uh, I, I created a couple of prototypes, um, uh, one that was just, uh, that still is worth looking at. It's not worth using, but it's worth looking at uh, because it does have some kind of fun examples in both Python and Rust that actually work, uh, that, that do this sort of concurrent uh, and composable, composable uh, I.O. Uh, the specification uh, was just merged. The, the modification is the specification to support the async ABI futures and streams was very recently merged uh, as of uh, last week uh, into the component model repo. Uh, so take a look at that if you're really interested in the details under the hood. Um, and then I have posted draft PRs for WASM tools, WhatBindGen, and WASM time for the guest and host side of things. Uh, stuff works. Uh, don't actually use this for anything serious. There are actually known security issues with my patch. Uh, it, there's a very long checklist of things that need to be done before. It's even reviewable, never mind uh, uh, mergeable. Uh, but we are making great progress there, and we do have some cool demos uh, that, that, that work. Uh, and uh, so next steps we are going to work on, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take the lead on uh, getting those PRs uh, cleaned up, uh, reviewed, merged. Um, that's going to unblock our ability to uh, start implementing support in WASI P3 uh, for the new WASI um, essentially the superset of WASI P2 that is WASI P3. Uh, but in order to do that, we do need to uh, update the WIT interfaces. Uh, for example, WASI file system uh, should, uh, the, the 3.0 or the 0.3 version of WASI file system should use the built-in uh, streams and futures uh, rather than the WASI IO versions, which we're deprecating. Uh, again, emphasizing you'll still be to use this as a developer. You'll be able, still be to use the YZIO stuff and the, the existing 02 interfaces. Uh, those aren't going away, uh, but uh, uh, you know. So we're going to start defining that, and then 
uh, JCO support, so we want this to work in the browser, we want it to work in Node. Uh, we, we have kind of a self-declared, uh, you know, as, as a WASI subgroup, uh, self-declared criteria to have at least two implementations before we can consider moving it to phase four. Uh, so that needs to happen. Uh, and been already been talking with Guy and uh, Calvin and others about what that looks like. Calvin's been doing some great work on uh, JSPI integration in JCO, uh, which will uh, be very much relevant to this implementation. And then uh, updated binding generators for other languages. I think this is super important. It's very important to me personally because I think this is like, could make or break, you know, uh, WASM success is, is how great, how, how good our uh, per language tooling is. Uh, and we also really want to make sure that we can deliver what we said we were going to deliver in terms of idiomatic bindings and runtime integration. Uh, and there's enough differences between these different languages, how they want to do things, uh, that you know, we'll only really know we've done that successfully when we've actually done it. You know? So, uh, so. there's that. Uh, <clears throat> I'm good. I don't have a lot of time here, so I'm actually going to, if you guys are interested in the gritty details of the WASM time implementation, I can go ahead and ask questions at the end, um, but I want to maybe come back to this. Uh, I kind of want to read the audience here, uh, but it's kind of, if you want to geek out on like details of implementing stuff in WASM time, we can definitely do that. Um, the one thing I did want to point out, because it's relevant to Christoph's presentation, uh, uh, just now is, um, you know, essentially he was talking about zero copy uh, situations where you've got large byte buffers that you need to transfer, you know, across some bus or some network or something, and you really want to minimize copies. Uh, and so the really great thing is the design of WASI P3 and the component model uh, underpinnings were uh, essentially conceived with interfaces like IO U-Ring uh, in mind. And so if you're not familiar with IO U-Ring, it's, it's this new hot uh, interface in Linux for doing uh, IO uh, in a way that minimizes sy system calls, which have become very expensive with Spectre and so on mitigations. And what that means is uh, the, the, the vision is that a, uh, you know, a future version of uh, a WebAssembly runtime that implements this and implements streams could potentially essentially allow the guest to allocate a buffer that then gets passed to the kernel as an own buffer that can then be copied into from the network card. Uh, and then it's, there's no need to copy from, you know, say, from kernel space to user space and then from host space into guest space. We, you know, we just go, we write the bytes straight to where they're, they belong. Uh, so that's the vision here. Uh, there's nothing in the, uh, the standard that would prevent that. Uh, it would just be an implementation uh, task at that point. Uh, okay, let's see. So uh, if you are interested in kind of getting involved in this effort, uh, so far it's been kind of almost a skunk works thing where we're just kind of getting prototypes together and you know kicking the tires. Uh, well, you can certainly help with that, uh, kick the tires. Uh, I've got links to a, uh, both both prototypes and a demo repo that uses the the uh, the same code that's in those PRs I mentioned. Um, and then, uh, you know, d definitely say hi on the Bytecode Alliance uh, Zulip chat, uh, you know, if, if you're interested in helping out. Uh, and we do have a GitHub project board that you can check out uh, and see what's in the backlog. Um, and we're happy to kind of, uh, you know, mentor uh, and or uh, just discuss design concerns, et cetera. And just got a bunch of links here, uh, and I think I'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Any questions or comments, concerns? Pablo. Hey, I have two easy ones, and one is a good one. Uh-oh. Okay, so the question is, uh, first, first question is, are we going to make the WASI HTTP 0 0.3 uh, interface compatible with 0 0.2? And, uh, no, which HTTP 2, sorry, thank you. Okay, good, good clarification. With HTTP 2, yes, so there, um, <clears throat> There's no immediate plans. The, 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 I believe until might have an update on this, but because uh, he's been working on that, I think we're going to do that before HTTP 03. And so anything we do, anything we address in 02 will be addressed in 03 as well. Yeah. 
uh, it, it's going to be deprecated as part of WASI I.O., uh, so not immediately, uh, and the expectation is that we'll be able to virtualize it in terms of WASI P3 uh, uh, at some point. That part is a little hazy to me, to be honest, so I'll have to, we'll, we'll have to see what that looks like. Uh, the, uh, the alternative is that basically WASI P3 is going to have this notion of task IDs, which have the same sort of rigor as pullable resource handles in terms of non-forgeability and that sort of thing. Uh, they'll mean something a little bit different, and actually the way we're call calling them waitables because they could be tasks or they could be uh, future or stream read write operations, but they'll operate similarly and you'll be able to do things like, you know, implement uh, a POSIX poll or select uh, in terms of the primitives that the component model provides. Yes. Yeah, I don't, that's a good point. I don't know if I put that on the project board yet, so I need to do that if I haven't already. Yeah, WASI, WASI libc will need to be updated to, uh, to, use, to use the new stuff. Other questions? Yeah, on the previous slide, the link to the set demo repo. Yeah. Um, that's not just PDF. It's oh, it, it is, uh, let's see, uh, which one? Uh, yes, the, it's the third link on this slide. Sorry, I did make some changes like, like an hour ago <laughs> to the presentation. Okay, yeah, I, uh, it's, it's in both, it should be in that one too, and I'll upload the latest slides as well. Chris? Could you do a customized scheduler? A customized? Yeah, you're asking if you could have a customized scheduler. Are we talking about like in a host implementation or in the guest? Yeah. And you're probably coming at this from an embedded standpoint, like you want to be able to like maybe handle interrupts or something, you know, uh, in an efficient way and that sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, I, my, my mind has always been in like a WASM time implementation so far, uh, which we're kind of thinking more in terms of like cloud computing, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, I am aware of goings on, especially in the Rust community, using async away, you know, in a very lightweight way to handle uh, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I... Uh, I, I think so. Uh, you could definitely write your own implementation uh, of this as, as long as it conforms to the ABI. Um, uh, is there any specific concern you would have about kind of implementing these primitives that I could address or? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Possibly, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think, you, you, I mean, you can write the scheduler. Uh, uh, again, I'm coming from the REST perspective where, you know, they don't have a built-in runtime. You can provide your own runtime, and it could, uh, it could be based on, you know, interrupts, et cetera. Uh, and uh, yes, the, 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 in, the interface that we have defined for WASI P2, or sorry, for P3, basically it, it makes no assumptions about it being based on some particular algorithm. Uh, so I, yes, I think there's flexibility there. Yeah. Yeah. Right, and so uh, my question for you, okay, so and to repeat the, uh, the, the comment question here uh, is what, what's missing is a task prioritization, being able to, you know, especially in a real-time context, you've got some things that are infinitely more important than others. Um, so there's nothing built in right now in the design, and by the way, this is a great time to give feedback. It's not set in stone in any way. I should have said that right up front. Uh, you know, we're, we're very open to making changes. Uh, perhaps part of what you're getting at here is maybe you want the guest to be able to kind of define the priority and communicate that to the host. Uh, there is no mechanism for that right now, but I think that seems like a really great idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Absolutely. Yeah. So just repeating this for the recording, uh, uh, you know, there, there are exist there's existing embedded frameworks, uh, and and POSIX itself allows you to specify uh, thread priority, uh, and being able to do that on a task basis, uh, you know, would be very helpful. So yeah, I agree with that. 